that God would bless their class today. Amen. Would you bow your heads? Put your hand toward God, toward our children. Thank you, Lord, for our children, these blessings you've given us. We ask you to bless their class today, bless the teaching, the teacher, the students, and the learning, all to your glory, both now and forever. Amen. And amen. It's good to be in God's house with all of you today who made it. We're going to be in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians today. The New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14 is from where we will be ministering the Word of God. Chapter 14 today. We'd like you to be reminded that April the 9th is Easter, Resurrection Sunday this year. April the 9th. We will also be on that same day, because it happens to be on that day this year, celebrating our one year anniversary in this brand new building. Since I was here for the tearing down of the old and the building of the new, if I'm here 15 years, I'm still going to probably call this the brand new building. (laughs) Because when you're in that, when you're part of the process, you just kind of, just kind of sticks with you like that. And so, uh, one year anniversary and Easter Resurrection Sunday is on April the 9th. Now we had some invitations on the back table. We may still have some left if you'd like to take them, hand them out to your coworkers. Uh, all the people who tell you don't push your religion on them, but they always push their religion on you. Okay, their atheism and their secularism and their cursing and their whatever else, they push it on you every day. Okay, that's their religion being pushed upon you. But you know, you don't push your religion on them, right? Well, Easter is one of those times where you can kind of get away with it, all right? Because, you know, most even secularist people, they understand and respect Easter at least a little bit. Christmas and Easter. So we have some invitations if there's any left. We have, we're getting more printed. They'll be ready next week. But they're on the back table back there. If you want to take some, there are these postcards. Hey, I know you don't come to church very often, but come to Easter, right? April 9th, 11 a.m. And we're expecting God to bless greatly on that day. And so that'll be our one-year anniversary. If they say, well, I don't believe I well, come celebrate our one-year anniversary. Hey, look, I'm giving you promotion material right here. Are you ready? All right, some of you are business owners. Y'all ought to know something about promotions and material and promoting events and promoting banners on Facebook and all across the Internet and all the flashing banners that pop up in people's email, all that stuff. <laughs> I used to do all that stuff, and we still do some of it with church. I'm literally telling you things to promote. So if they don't care about Easter, they don't care about church, well, look, we're celebrating one year in our church. Can you come celebrate our one-year anniversary with us? Take out, the ch- take out religion from it. Just come celebrate one-year anniversary with us. How about that? See, anything. Right? Let them, let them, tell them there will be food afterwards. Hey, there's going to be food and refreshments afterwards. Something, right? I mean, bring your stomach at least, anything. <laughs> Just come sit down. Because really what we want is for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? And so do whatever you got to do. Promise them a hamburger after church, whatever, right? Maybe somebody will bring hamburgers and there's a free burger and it was free to you also. How about that? And so, and so whatever, all right? Tell them, hey, well, tell you what, I'll make sure you get fed afterwards. All right, we'll make sure you get fed. You don't have to tell them it's going to be free food afterwards. You don't have to tell them you're not cooking everything. Hey, I'll tell you what, I'll make sure we'll take you out to eat. Where are we going to eat? I'll, I'll show you when we're, when we, after, after church. We'll, I'll show you. All right, church is over. Let's go upstairs. There you go. You took them out to eat, didn't you? There you go. So, hey, do whatever, right? Think outside the box. Okay? Think outside the normal, everyday mediocrity box that we all fall into sometimes. Expand. Come up with a reason to get them in the church. Amen. Be creative. If we're creative in our daily lives, with our, whether we're teaching our children or we're running our business, we have to be creative. I've, had, I've owned a few businesses in times past. You got to be creative. You got to stay creative so you can stay ahead of the curve and ahead of competition. So if we can be creative for that, can't we be creative for God? Amen. I'm looking for a creative, a creativity team in the church, but I can only work with whom and with what I have. So we're encouraging you to learn how to be creative. Today, 1 Corinthians 14. So that's April the 9th, Easter resurrection celebration. I call it Easter because that's how the world knows it. I call it resurrection because Jesus was raised from the dead. And it's really, other than obviously Jesus being born into this life, his resurrection from the dead is the next most important point of Christianity. Because he would say in 1 Corinthians 15, the next chapter over, if Jesus is not raised, your faith is vain. 
You can believe on a Jesus who was born. You can believe on a Jesus who died on a cross. But if he didn't get raised from the dead, it doesn't matter what you believe. All right. So that's really what Easter is all about. First Corinthians 14, verse 10. But that's not what we're preaching about today. All right. Just giving you a little heads up. First Corinthians 14, verse 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world. And none of them is without signification. We welcome those of you online today as well. Verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel. In other words, it's great to you know, want to be spiritual and things of that nature. But even more than that, he's saying, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. In other words, there's a greater purpose. Let's bow our heads today in prayer. With Edgar, would you pray, please, sir? Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 14, verse 10 will be our starting point. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Our title for today's message, Hearing the Right Voices. Hearing the Right Voices. Now, among other topics in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul the Apostle is dealing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not teaching about that so much today, but I will just talk about it lightly here because that's what he's dealing with in this chapter. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a work of God in the life of someone who's already accepted Jesus. It's what brings the power of God into your life. And this baptism is a giving of the power of God without measure. Now, there are many people who believe when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. The Bible shows us you get a measure of the Holy Spirit. Enough to have faith and enough to believe and enough to start learning and living for God. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a subsequent work. It happens after the fact which brings the Spirit without measure or without limitation in your life. And so that's what he's dealing with in 1 Corinthians 14. And if you've been saved, you need to be praying and asking God to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, that's your homework as a Christian. You need to go home and ask God, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And you pray what comes to your mind and let God do the rest. Amen. We'll teach on that another time as God leads. But in this particular point, He's bringing out about hearing the right voices. Now, when we talk about hearing the right voices, that entails that there are wrong voices. As a Christian, we cannot and should not and should strive not to fulfill the stereotype that Christians are ignorant people. Sadly, the way some people operate, you don't know if they know anything. Some people go to church, you may see it, 30, 40, 50 years in the same church, don't know hardly anything about the Bible. And there's a stereotype for a reason. So therefore, it should not be that way, though it is, many times. So the right voices entails there's always an opposite, which means there's always wrong voices. Hearing the right voices. It's very important to ensure that we are listening to the right voices depending on what we're doing. 
Now that's very important what I just said. Depending on what we are doing, I'm going to listen to a plumber about how to unclog a drain, but I'm not going to listen to a plumber about heart transplants. You understand, right? It depends on what we're doing. I'll listen to a dentist about dental work, but probably not about astrophysicism, unless he's got a major in astrophysics and is a, and is, and is a dentist. Then sure, whatever, we'll talk about that also. But usually, it's not that way. So there are times to listen to certain voices at certain times. And then there are times that the, even those same voices, you should not be listening to. List, or rather, hearing the right voices. Different voices have different meanings. As he says in verse 10, they are all... He says it in the double negative. None of them is without signification. Another way of saying that, they all have a meaning of some sort. All voices in the world have some sort of meaning. So it is not whether there's a meaning behind that voice. And when we say a voice, we're talking about people that we listen to. Some we should, some we should not. Some we should sometimes, some we should never. So in other words, all voices have a meaning. So that's not the question. The question is, what is their meaning? That's really what you should be asking. What are they really about? That's what you have to discover. Because once you find out what someone really is about, then you are expected by God, and me also for myself, we are each expected by God to then make the right choice. We're expected. Are you with me today? It is not expected that someone comes along and convinces me to make. We are expected to make the right choice. And by the way, that decision can determine whether you are to heaven or hell. It's an eternal decision. you got to make sure you're hearing the right voices. So he says they're not without signification. In other words, just because someone has something to say doesn't mean you should be listening. And just because someone has something to say, maybe you should be listening. Ultimately, we need to learn how to listen to God. Are you with me on that today? You need to understand that. We need to learn how to listen to God. And not everyone who names the name of God is someone you should listen to. I've got to pay attention to this. I, there are, man, I don't know, tens of thousands of people on YouTube I've got a handful of people that I receive mentorship and teaching from, uh, whether in person or, or electronically, whatever. But it applies to me and it applies to you. We all have to make sure we're listening to the right voices. And the number one voice we should be listening to is the voice of God. And I'm going to teach you here in a little bit about how to hear the voice of God. Because that confuses a lot of people. How do I know if it's God or how do I know if it's me? So I'm going to teach you here in a little bit about how to know the difference. And so therefore, without signification, or they're not without signification. In other words, all voices have a meaning of some sort. The goal is to find out what the meaning is. What do I mean by meaning? The intentions. What is their intention for what they are saying to us? Sir, ma'am, there are people who can ruin your life if you listen to the wrong ones. And then there are those who can bless your life if you listen to the right ones. How do you know the difference? I'm going to tell you in a minute. Our goal today is hopefully to help you leave this house of God more educated on this topic than you were when you came in. Depending on the situation, we must ensure we are listening to the right voices. For instance, personal trainers can help us get in physical shape if we let them. And by the way, over the ne these next couple of examples, I want to see if you pick up on the theme of all these examples. Personal trainers can help us get in physical shape if we let them. Teachers can help us get in educational shape if we let them. Leaders can help us get in professional shape if we let them. Preachers and pastors can help us get in spiritual shape if we let them. What's the topic? What's the theme? If we let them. If we let them. It is your choice today as to whether or not you learn anything from this message. I'm going to communicate the best I can. 
I learn about public speaking. I learn from public speakers and how to speak publicly. I try to learn better at being a better communicator. Just because someone's talking doesn't mean they're communicating anything. You ever heard someone talk a lot? You don't know what they're saying? They don't even know what they're saying. They try to act like they do, and you have no idea what they just said for the last 15 minutes straight without seemingly taking a breath. But you know people like that. We all do. They're talking, but they're not communicating. I try to learn how to better communicate. Everyone communicates even if they don't speak. Even if they don't speak. So I try to learn how to communicate with words as well as body language, etc. If we let them, so it is completely up to you today as to whether you learn anything. Though I try to do my part to communicate the truth. God's responsibility is to provide the right voices. Our responsibility is to listen to the right voices. Now that word responsibility is a word people don't like today. Don't you dare tell me what to do or I'll go find a preacher who won't tell me what to do. <laughs> it's your eternity. It's your eternity. Amen. It's your eternity. And your eternity will be what you make it. It will not be what I make it for you. It'll be what you make it. We hope you make the right choice for eternity. So God's responsibility is to provide the right voices to teach us how to determine between right and wrong voices. Our responsibility is to listen to the right ones and ignore the wrong ones. So first, let's talk about hearing the wrong voices. Let's get the negative one out of the way, right? Hearing the wrong voices. Pastor Fulmer, I want to hear about the love and grace of God. You're going to. You're going to. But God's got a message for every one of us today. Amen. God's got a message for the. And if I can't preach what's relevant to you, then I'm not worth being a preacher. I'll say amen to that. I'm not worth you coming to my church. You should not come to my church if I am afraid to preach something that pertains to you, sometimes personally, whether I know about it or not. I may have already said something that hits home with somebody, and I have no idea that it does. That's called inspiration. And so if I can't preach the truth that pertains to you, you should not come here and I should not come here because we're just wasting our time. We're wasting, I'm wasting your time, you're wasting mine. Let's get out of here and go have a hamburger somewhere. Who cares? But if we do care about the truth, can you say amen today? If we care about the truth and we are as thick skinned as we like everybody to believe we are, and we're as unoffendable as we want everybody to think we are. I'm not trying to offend, but the word of God will offend you sometimes. It offends me. You want to know when the Bible offends me the most? When I'm wrong. That's when it offends me the most. How about you today? Amen. Hearing the wrong voices. Let's get that one done. You could be listening to the wrong voices and think you're listening to the right ones. And I'm going to teach you in a moment how to know the difference. You could be listening to the wrong voices and think you're listening to the right ones. Many people are bound by the things of sin because they've been listening to the wrong voices. This is what keeps many people bound in their sin. They think, I go to church, I should be free from sin by now. They think, I give my tithe, I should be free from this sin by now. They think, I've been baptized, I invite people, whatever all the tenets of Christianity are. Why do I still struggle? Are you listening to the wrong voices? You may be and not even be aware of it. First, let's talk about the intent. The, all voices are intangible. Let's listen to, let's first talk about the internal voices. Internal. How about the voices of fear? There are some people, many people who are afraid. Most people are afraid of something. We are all, including myself, afraid of something. And I'm not talking about fear of snakes and fear of Komodo dragons or whatever. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. Some people are very afraid to open up in relationship with other people. Some people will criticize other people and call it, quote, calling things as they are. I'm just calling it what it is. Yeah, your problem, the reason you don't have any friends is because you keep calling it. That's the reason. There's a difference between seeing what it is and calling it what it is. And just because you know it doesn't mean you should always call it. Amen. And really, that could be a subliminal defense mechanism 
to keep people 500 miles away from them so they don't get hurt. But they call it, but they want to be noble, so they call it calling it what it is until someone calls it what it is in their lives. And then they get offended, right? And then they, that's another reason to run 500 miles away from everybody because I got offended. Oh, they shouldn't have said that. It's okay for you, but not for them, right? So there are voices of fear, fear of commitment. There are people who are afraid to commit to anything. The moment they start being looked to for a commitment, whether it be at work, whether it be at church, whether it be in a marriage, it doesn't matter. They'll do something to sabotage that commitment. They'll do something to sabotage that commitment because there's a fear of commitment. And they may not even know they have this fear. They'll just come up with some reason why it's the other person's fault and they're out. When really they're afraid of commitment. Maybe they saw mom having 500 boyfriends and they don't, they're don't. they afraid of commitment. Maybe they saw dad having 500 girlfriends and they're afraid of commitment. Who knows? Maybe they, mom or dad left them when they were young and they never really met their parents and they're afraid of commitment. See, we have subliminal fears that we may not even be aware of. The idea, the goal is not to run away from them. It's really to turn, to acknowledge them and engage with them and then give it to God. Amen. That's your own personal choice, though. 2 Timothy 1.7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, when people read that, that sometimes they may think, well, God, God doesn't want me to be afraid of anything. That is not what that Bible scripture means. He doesn't say God hath not given us fear. That's not what the Bible says. It says he hath not given us what? The spirit of fear. There are some things you need to be afraid of. You need to be afraid of, of uh, messing around with poisonous animals, venomous animals. I know there's a difference. There, you ought to be afraid of that. When I say afraid, I'm not talking about run and scream and burn the house down, trying to kill the spider. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I can get another house. All right, whatever. But a healthy understanding that I need to keep my distance from certain things. That's a form of fear, but it's healthy fear. He said, he, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Here's the spirit of fear. I've already talked about it a little bit. That fear that overcomes you when things start getting a little too uncomfortable for you. And that coping mechanism, that defense mechanism kicks in and you distance yourself. You know, there are people because they're afraid of commitment and connection with other people. They'll openly criticize and they'll openly call people names and they'll come across really angry at them. And they'll think it's because they made me mad. It's not because they made you mad. It's because you don't, you don't have the coping skills to work through that situation. So you, you, you attack and you defend and you run away because you haven't, been, you haven't learned the coping skills. But God wants to give us coping skills so that the spirit of fear no longer overcomes us. Pastor, I didn't come here for a psychology class. Well, you're getting it today because God knows that the root of our problems is in our psychology. It's in our psychology. So that's the voices of fear. How about the voices of laziness and stubbornness? Laziness and stubbornness. Now, I like, to a degree, I like stubborn people. I like stubborn people because when a stubborn person gets their mind made up, that's it. They're doing that. Now, it's a it's a positive and it's a negative, right? It's it's a it can cut you going and it can cut you coming, whatever, depending on which way the blade's moving. If they're stubborn about the wrong things, they're stubborn about the wrong things. And if you've been stubborn about having your way today, you're stubborn about the wrong things. But whenever that person really gets saved, and I mean they make up their mind, I am going to serve God. I know it's right. I know it's true. My eternity is in my hand, not in the hand of my mom and dad or my kids or my neighbor or the pastor and his wife or my husband or wife. My eternity is in my hand. Whether anybody else goes or not, I'm going to serve God. When that stubborn person makes that decision, you cannot shake them. You cannot shake them. And that's when I really like working with stubborn people because they got their minds made up. They don't care who says what. They are going to serve God. 
Man, you're looking at a stubborn person right now, by the way. Right? You're looking at one. I'm a stubborn person. When I make up my mind to do something, I latch on. If I feel it's right and the right thing to do, it's ethically right. It's right in, the, in character and all of that, especially serving God. You ain't, you're not shaking me. All right. It's just, you're not sh- the die's been cast. The mold is shaped. It's done. It's set. That's the way you got to be serving God. Are you with me today? That's the way you got to be. My wife is the same way. If I were to walk away from God, she's going to show up to church. And she's going to preach until they bring a new pastor in. That's what she's, she's in. That's it. If she ever walked away, I'm coming to church. Thank God, by God's grace, neither one of us plan on doing that anytime soon. But that's the way you've got to be. Otherwise, you might be worshiping someone else. Amen? You might be worshiping someone else. Laziness and stubbornness. Are you stubborn about the right things? It's okay to be stubborn, but you've got to be stubborn about the right things. About the voices of unbelief. Hebrews 4 and 7, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's what Paul says. Don't harden your hearts. We make a decision whether we're going to harden our hearts or we're going to let God soften our hearts. Our prayer today is you would let God soften your heart. But that's the voice of unbelief. That's what he's talking about there in Hebrews 4 and 7. What's the unbelief? Not that you don't believe there's a God. But you may not believe that God is going to hold you accountable one day. You may not believe that. That's unbelief. And that right there, sir, man, what that does is it causes us to start listening to the wrong voices. Because if we don't want to believe in the holiness and righteousness of God, and we don't want to believe that God's going to hold me accountable for how I serve him, you know what we're going to look for? We're going to go look for someone who will tell us something we want to hear. The Bible talks about it, that there will be people who heap to themselves these teachers and their ears will itch for what they want to hear. And there will always be those teachers. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you what you want to hear. You just come be part of what I'm doing. Sir, ma'am, without God, you're not smart enough to know the difference. And neither am I. Amen. Some of us got college degrees. We are not smart enough. To know the difference without the guidance of God. Amen. Don't let your, don't let your uh, intellect become an idol to you. Don't let your intellect become an idol. Without God, we are not intelligent. We're intelligent, but we're not intelligent enough in the things that matter. How about the voices of those who are only wrapped up in the things of this life? We would call it materialism. Secularism. They're only worried about what they're doing in this life. First John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And so that's talking about those people who are just part of the social scene. They're part of the social scene. They're part of the latest trends. Part of the latest fads. The latest social movements. But they don't care about what God's doing. Sir, ma'am, God is not a social movement God. God is an eternity movement God. He's an eternity movement God. That was 1 John 2.15. Are the voices you're listening to, are they helping you or are they causing harm in your life? Are they helping you or are they causing harm in your life? You'll know if they're the right voices, depending on whether they're tearing things down or helping to build things up. Now, let me share something with you. Even if it turns out that someone is tearing things down in your life, sir or ma'am, ultimately it is not their fault. It's your responsibility to reject those voices. Are you with me? There is no shortage of cult leaders in this world. And they t- I've seen it. I've watched it take place real time. In real time. One of the first things they do is they tear you away from others and they pull you to themselves. That's a cult mindset. You can go back to Genesis chapter 11 and read there about the Tower of Babel and Nimrod and how he got together all these people to rebel against God. 
So are they trying to tear you down? Or are they trying to build you up? Now, when I say these things, what I mean is, are they tearing down your family? Are they tearing down your relationships with others? Are they building up your family? Are they building up your relationships with others? you got to be smart enough to make the right choices, brother and sister. Amen. I'll say amen for you. All right, you just got to do this. And so therefore, what are the results of listening to them? That's one of the main reason, main ways you'll know if it's right or wrong. This is not Pastor Fulmer's opinion hour. This is the Bible. Amen. I just read some scriptures to you. And so one of the ways, not the only way, I'm going to share some more, but one of the ways as I look around, is their influence tearing down my life? Or is it building me up? Is it making my family stronger or is it making it weaker? That's number one. And I'm saying number one because those are the more obvious things. You know, sometimes what we would call obvious, they aren't so obvious to some people. I mean, it's just sometimes it just seems like it's just not so obvious. When it's extremely obvious. Next, another way to know is provided they are building you up. So let's talk about that now. Hearing the right voices. Are they using the word of God as their foundation? Now, I'm not talking about using the word of God as a foundation to tear people down. You understand we got to cross the first bridge first. Amen. You got to cross the first bridge first. As I look around in the obvious realm of life, are, is this person, are these people an asset or are they a liability in my life? Yeah, that's number one. You got to cross that bridge first. Even if they're using the word of God, forget that. Are they a benefit or are they a liability? Then, once I decide that people are actually helping my life, helping my family, helping my mental health, helping my emotional life, whatever, are they using the Bible? Are they using God's Word? Because there are plenty of people in the world who mean good for you, but they want to teach you from a secularism mindset. Okay? That means that stems from their education. I'm not knocking education. I've got a college degree myself in accounting. I've got to, I understand this. I'm not knocking scientific research and sociological research. We, okay, a lot of those things can help you filter through a lot of extra work that someone else already did. That's fine. But with all those things and above all those things, do they trust the Word of God? So what have we talked about? Are they destroying my life or are they building my life up? Next, are they teaching me from a secular place where it's just the world's teachings? Or are they taking those teachings and also coupling it with the Bible for character training and for morality training? See, this is how you'll know if you're hearing the right voices. Whose choice is it to make the right choice? Our choice, is it not? I can't come into your life. I cannot counsel you into making the right choice. I provide counseling at certain times. or certain times I can, certain times I can't, and I just have to keep a certain schedule. But I cannot counsel willingness into you. Understand that, right? You need to understand that. I cannot counsel willingness into your heart. I can only counsel you about things. You have to be willing to be made willing by God. Those with the wrong voices will always be trying. Listen now. Those with the wrong voices will always be trying to force you to listen or obey. We'll say that too. Very forceful. We've got to learn to see what's really happening in front of us. Can we take a break here and give God a good amen? Amen, all right? We've got to be able to see it. Now, it's great if the pastor can see it. It's great if the neighbor can see it. It's great if the husband or wife can see it for us. But we have to see it for ourselves. Anyone who comes along and feels the need to force you into something, you need to step back and pay attention. I'm, I'm here, I may seem forceful, 
But that's just, I have a passion, and I believe men and women ought to have a passion in their lives. Okay? God can't do much with somebody who's just mediocre, milk toast, has no passion. You've got to have a passion about something. All right? Passion. All right. But if someone's forcing you into something, you need to pay attention. Anyone who truly, who is truly of God will try to, now listen, try to lead you to listen. But they will not force you to listen. I'm taking it slow today because this message is, is it's on point somewhere. I just felt it in my spirit. Some of y'all might be listening to the wrong people. And they may even be in your family. Just saying, J-S. All right? They may even be in your family. So those with the wrong voices, what do they do? They try to force. You want to know why? Because what they're doing is not godly, so they themselves have to step in and force it. When something is of God, I will tell you this, the Holy Spirit, it just He just makes it flow. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a He. He's a person. Just like the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit's a person. And so therefore, the Holy Spirit, He just makes, it just flows. When you're ready to hear the truth and you're open to the truth and you want to know the truth, that Holy, the Holy Spirit, He just makes it flow right into your heart. There's a peace about it. All of a sudden, all the wrong voices we may have been listening to, though they may forcefully try to get us to listen to them, we have zero problem telling them, get away from me. Are you with me? You'll have no problems. I'll tell you right now, when, when I got saved, when I really got saved, which simply means this, I just submitted my life to God. That's some people's problem. They just don't want to submit to God. They think that makes them less of a valuable person. It does not. When I finally submitted my life to God, for those who kept trying to step in and pull me back, I had zero problem telling them in so many words, get out of my face, get away from me. In so many words. I didn't say it like that, but the attitude was there. I'm going, as for me and my house. Don't we love that verse, Joshua 24, 15? As for me and my house. Oh, I love that verse. Joshua 24, 15. Uh, we will serve the Lord. You know what Joshua was saying in his heart when he was saying those words with his mouth? I don't care what anybody says or does. I don't care what anybody thinks. And there were lots of people who did not like his stand for God. That's why he said that. What he was saying was, we're going to serve God. See, we like it as a verse hanging on the front door. You got it hanging on your front door, leave it. Nothing wrong with that. I don't know about it. I'm sure at least somebody does, and it's okay. It's fine, whatever. Leave it there. But say it with the intention that Joshua said it. All the wrong voices are not going to change my mind. All right. So what did we just learn? Wrong voices are forceful. Sometimes you're asking yourself, why are they so angry? Why do they just, you, ever, you need to observe these things about people. Why are they so angry? Not why do they sound angry. I sound angry sometimes. I try not to, but it is what it is, whatever. But you can tell when someone's just mad. I mean, they're just mad. And they don't even know why. They're angry about something. You ever known anyone like that? I mean, they're just mad about something. Ugh, I mean, they got the ugly face going. You know, a, a, um, an angry spirit can turn a beautiful woman or a handsome man into an ugly woman or man. All right? They can have all the features, but man, mm, mm -mm. all right? When they say beauty is skin deep, but ugly goes to the bone. Really ugly goes to the soul. It goes to the soul, right? One good thing to say, well, in this PC world, you can't say this anymore. <laughs> Though most people don't care, aren't really, don't care as much about PC as they act like they do. They just kind of have to be a certain way to keep their job and blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. I can say that because I'm a preacher. Right? There you go. And so it used to be you could say, you're too pretty to be acting so ugly. You're too pretty to be acting so well. You, my physical features, up, there's more to me than that. Yes, there is, but right now, all I see is ugly. 
You're the one hiding everything else about you behind an ugly attitude. There's a lot more to you than that. But gee, can you get over that and quit blocking it so I can see the whole person? All right, there you go. Sometimes we block our own beauty, don't we? Sometimes we do. All right, where's that in my outline? Nowhere to be found. All right, let's keep going here. I'm not mad today, but you know, I'm mad at the devil. Amen? I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad at sin. I'm mad at the wrong voices. And so therefore, hearing the right voices. The wrong voices are forceful. The right voices will try to lead you. But you know what they do? They give you space to grow and make decisions even if you're making the wrong decisions. I have to do that. I am not so desperate for people in my church that I will do wrong and let people and try to chase people. And No, no, no. I can't do that. Well, God won't let me. There are lots of people that some of you may remember coming to church. They're not here anymore. I'm going to text them for Easter. Okay, So all those people that some of you have brought that we haven't seen in months, they're going to get a text from Pastor Fulmer about Easter. I don't care if they like it or not. They're going to get a text. That's my last ditch effort. And then we just let them go. Amen. Well, you know, if someone quits coming to church, I'll text them two or three times. After that, I got to avoid the whole, hey, he's harassing me. Okay, I got to get away from all that because people are babies nowadays. Hey, he's harassing me. They can't just say I'm not, I'm not interested. Okay, they're not that mature. If someone says I'm not interested, okay, thank you for the answer. That's all I need from you. All right? But after two or three times, I will stop checking. And then I'll check them again for Easter. All right? and that's, that's how I do it. And then the next time will be 4th of July or something. And then after that, it'll be Christmas or whatever the case. Meaning, if I haven't checked them for Easter, I'll check them for 4th of July. If I haven't checked them for that, I'll check them for Christmas. I don't check them all the holidays. So when I check people for Easter, that's it. If they don't show up, that's it. Between them and God. Here's, what I, here's how we got to that point. Those with the right voices will try to lead you. Right? Lead you. But true people who understand true leadership realize you cannot force lead anybody. You cannot. You can try to lead them. What is that old saying? You can give a man a fish, but you can't make him drink? I'm just kidding. I made that one up. All right. <laughs> I made that one up. They call that a euphemism. I call that a mephemism because I made it up. So that's a mephemism. And so they talk about leading a horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink. Here's what I think about leadership. How about making the horse thirsty so he starts drinking for himself? How about that? All right, you're not here for that, but learn how to make people thirsty for something better. And they'll just go drink by themselves. All right. If you got to force people to drink, they don't want to drink. And so therefore, the right voices will try to lead you. The wrong voices are always trying to force you. If you find someone always trying to force you into something, you need to take a step back. You need to take a step back. Because you might be being used. You might be getting used by somebody. Jesus is not just a nobody. He's not even just an anybody. But He's God's beloved Son. And He told us there in the Gospels, Mark 9 and 7, God the Father said, This is My beloved Son. Hear Him. Listen to Him. How do we listen to Him? Two ways. Learn the Word of God. How do you learn the Word of God? Bible study, Tuesday night at 7.30. It's amazing how many people ask this question. What's a good way to study the Bible? Um, come to Bible study. Doesn't that just make too much sense? Is there another answer? Not really one that's going to work, no. Come to Bible study. To study... Let me say it in Hebrew because they go from right to left. To study the Bible. All right, there you go. Let me pass through just for a moment, okay? How do you hear the voice of God? Number one, learn. I'll say this first. Learn to spend time in prayer. It takes discipline to pray. That's why we don't pray. We're not disciplined. Number two, learn the Word of God. How do you effectively learn the Word of God? It is not by Google searching. It's not by YouTube searching. It's not by buying commentaries. 
and getting lost in them? Here's how you do it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and then 11 through 12. Wherefore, when he ascended up on high, who's he talking about? Jesus. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Verse 11, verses 11 and 12, tell us what those gifts are. Listen now, we're almost done. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, here's the reason. For the perfecting of the saints. That means to make you better. My job, my calling is to make you sharper and smarter and better in God. That's my calling. Sometimes I got to push. Sometimes I got to pull. Sometimes I got to just leave you sitting right there. Whatever is needed at the time. Today I would say it's probably a pushing message. But we need that, amen? Hey, if we're going to push our soldiers at work, don't, get, don't tell God he can't push you. Come on now, don't be hypocrites. You're going to push your employees to do better and provide customer service because your business depends upon it. If you're going to push your, your, uh, your, uh, your suppliers to provide your materials and whatever you're selling, if you're going to push your soldiers and make sure they get the formation on time, let me just leave that right there. Let's make sure we get to God's formation on time. All right? Article 15, can't give you one, but you have to love God. Here we go. Verse 12, to perfect you, to sharpen you, to make you better. Why? For the work of the ministry, he says in verse 12. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Three major reasons why God gave you a pastor. Now, while most people look at preachers and pastors as simply someone to disagree with, it's just church. As one man said, just church? How about we're here to teach you how to get into eternity with God? He says here, our job, our calling is to perfect you so that you will do the work of ministry with us. That's what he's saying there in Ephesians 4.12. You're supposed to be working with us so that the whole body is edified. Amen. So the whole body is edified. Pastor Fulmer, is it 12.30 yet? It's only 12 o'clock. All right, stick with me now. What are we preaching about today? Hearing the right voices. I'm getting ready to close it down, don't worry. Hearing the right voices. As you examine your life, as you examine your life, have you been listening to the right voices or the wrong voices? Have you been listening to the right voices or the wrong voices? Catherine, can you grab that remote, point it up at the heater, and hit the red button, pointing it up? At a point. Yep, just point it up, hit the red button, until it beeps. There you go, you got it. Leave it alone. There you go. Thank you. Leave it alone. It sounded so mean. That's it. <laughs> just that's, uh, anyway, stop, stop. Pastor Fulmer, stop. Okay, here we go. I know I'm not the only one who acts like that, right? Uh, let's stop. Uh, okay, here we go. Anyway, come on. That former NCO stuff. All right, here, leave that in the past. Good job. Thank you. Hearing the right voices. We're getting ready to close it down. As you look around your life, don't answer this out loud, just to yourself and God. Have you been listening to some of the wrong voices? Have you been letting people tear you apart? And I, they may say they've got good intentions, but their actions speak louder than words. Come on now, actions are way louder than words. Have they been pulling you apart from those you love? Has there been strife because of them? There's a point at which you need to say, I'm done. I've got to serve God. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house. Another way of saying that? My family. My family. Outside of God, your family, okay, un, within God, your family is the most important. And then among that, you're, then, then it's the family of God. Okay, the family of God. Outside of your household in God. 
your cousins, aunts, uncles, brothers, and sisters way off in another, well, probably another country for most of, or all of us here. They are even further down the line if they're not serving God. You understand, right? So it's God, your immediate family, the family of God, because we want to sharpen each other. And then anybody in your, anybody in your biological family who's not serving God, hey, I put them after the family of God. Because I'm in, the fam- I'm in a different family. Now, I want them to be saved. Amen. I want my unsaved cousins and aunts and uncles and whoever else. I want them to be saved. I recently sent a text message witnessing to somebody in my family. And um, going through a hard time. And I said, well, I wish I could help. I said, but God said if you would call on him, he would help you. And I haven't gotten a response to that text. Yet, that's been almost a month now. They haven't responded whatsoever. They didn't respond, thank you. Okay, hey, I did my part to witness. I want them to be saved. I want to see them in heaven. But you know what? After God, after my immediate family, the family of God is after that. And then my biological family, and then my friends, coworkers, whatever, and then everybody else that I don't know and may never meet. See, we've got to get things in right order, church. We've got to get things in the right order. Sometimes we, if we're putting the opinion of our friends and coworkers before the opinions of our family members or the family of God, that we're all supposed to be uh, in the same arena with the Bible and whatnot, then we're out of order. We're out of order. I don't expect you to put my preferences before your husband or wife. I should never be doing that. I expect you to put God's commandments before your husband or wife, but never the way I would do things. You got to make that decision for yourself. Now, today's been a bit of a different message. I get that. Not angry. I'm angry at God God of this world. The devil, angry at the devil, angry at sin, angry at liars, angry at the wrong voices, but I want what's best for you. Hearing the right voices. Let's go ahead and bow our heads today and close our eyes. So the question before us, if you've been listening to the wrong voices, are you going to keep doing that? Some people will. Some people will keep listening to the wrong voices. Even after they hear this message, they're going to keep right on listening to the wrong voices. Or will you listen to God's voice? And you'll know if you have a pastor who cares for you or not. You know. I don't have to convince you. You know already. Will you listen to God's voice? Our prayer today is that you would. Let's all find a place to pray. And let's connect with Jesus ourselves. That's the way it's got to be. You. Connected with Him personally. Our loving God, I commend this congregation to you. I ask you to do a great work in every individual heart. For truly we must stand before you personally. So help us not to be so needy for other people's opinions. But help us to need you. And I believe that right now at whatever stage of life we're in, I believe every one of us know what we are supposed to be. We don't need a theological explanation. I believe we know what we should be doing. Sometimes we're not always willing. I ask you, God, to help us to be willing. I commend the rest of this service into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. Why don't you connect with God and be real with Him? Just be real. And let Him do a work in your heart. Let's find a list of